Multiple greetings, everyone. Well, as you may know, education can either perpetuate the status quo and play a hegemonic function in society, or it can become an act of freedom in society, a means by which men and women can deal critically and creatively with reality and discover how to participate in the, in the transformation of their, of their world, as Paulo, Paulo Freire uh, uh, explained. His quote was relevant at that time, and it is still relevant and valid today. So, in this brief presentation, I would like to share with you some thoughts and tips on how to educate Educate English learners via call. This is a critical pedagogical approach. My name is Abdel Ilah Salim Sehlawi, and I'm professor of TESOL and Applied Linguistics. So, um, we have two challenges at the same time. A challenge of diversity, how to address diversity in education, and how to uh, meet the needs of culturally and linguistically diverse students. And the second one is, how can educators use computer technology to achieve this goal? Of course, there are some uh, pertinent questions that we can ask. One of them is, are our curricula and school today, functions and forms, are, are they adequate? So are, are we teaching or meeting the needs of our students? Do schools educate students for the 21st century or the 18th or 20th century? What lessons have we learned from the current COVID-19 crisis? What competences and skills do educators need to develop? How is digital media literacy defined from a critical perspective? And how can we create and upgrade our curricula and make sure we use education to transform and sustain our world for a better world? Those are excellent questions to cut, to, that come to mind, and, and we can address them in, in many ways. But in a, in a short and brief way, I would like to... Uh, start by looking at the powerful role of call, computer-assisted language learning. Of course, call it has become a field by itself, as you all know. And call now allows educators to empower themselves and their learners. It supports the theoretical and pedagogical foundation of differentiated instruction. So through call, you can meet the needs of individual students. You can help these students succeed academically and develop their second language acquisition. When, when this technology is, of course, used appropriately and efficiently. When it is not, it, it can create some disasters also. So technology can allow students and teachers to make their input accessible. And of course, there are so many web-based call resources that can enrich and support second language acquisition and connect life in the classroom with the real world. Something that critical pedagogy calls for, all right? And the 21st century skills and knowledge uh, require. So the first step that I would like to share with you is a step that was long time ago called for, which is know your students. If you don't know your students, you cannot serve them. So for instance, and generally speaking, if we know that in the 21st century, these students will be learning in a way that is different from the way we are learning today or the way we learned in the past. And since we are dealing with the linguistically and culturally diverse students, we need to know a little bit about second language acquisition theory and practice, 
we need to also know a little bit about some methodologies in the field of second language acquisition, including use of error analysis, contrastive analysis, that's what the EA and CA stand for. So, so knowing your students' second language acquisition stages of development, their cultural backgrounds, how they learn, how they live in their life. And of course, we can't do that till we also develop a critical cross-cultural communicative competence, or what I refer to as the C5. All right, critical cross-cultural communicative competence, which also includes the development of a critical pedagogical competence and a critical uh, technological competence, as it will be shown uh, later, and I will talk about that uh, in the next slides. So slide number four and five will give a definition of these competences and shows their interactive relationships. So step number one, know your students, know their stages of development. You need to have to develop a your own theory of second language acquisition and what happens when we learn a second language. And you start working on your C5 and your critical pedagogical competence and your critical technological competence. So these are prerequisites, let's say. All right. So to define these competences, of course, which is important, the C5 stands for the, the educator's ability to communicate effectively with diverse individuals across cultures while being aware of the importance of the power relations inherent in each cross-cultural encounter within its own socioeconomic and political context. So I'd like to emphasize that. This is not just that regular cross-cultural communicative competence. This is a critical cross-cultural communicative competence which requires the individual to be aware of the power relations inherent in each socio-political and socio-economic political context. Now, the critical technological competence that, that we have to use with call is, the, is that educators' ability to use call and digital media in general in a critical manner while being aware of the non-neutrality of such technology that can also contribute to widening the gap between the haves and have-nots. So that's important. We should not take that technology at its uh, uh, face value without questioning its non-neutrality and ability to widen the gaps. So as long as we are aware of that, we have a critical technological competence. As educators, we need to have what is called critical pedagogical competence. This competence allows educators, again, to use culturally responsive pe uh, pedagogy that empowers learners and educators who make meaningful connections between their classrooms and their local and global communities for a world that is sustainable, just, and prosperous. A world that fights racism, that eliminates racism and inequalities. The educators who possess CPC speak the language of critique and the language of possibility. And for examples of how these languages are used, I would refer you to pages 19 and 22 in my book, 2019, Sehlawi 2019, or 2018. At the heart of these competences is the critical theoretical foundation that stems from critical theory and the critical definition of what culture is from such perspective. This is powerful, folks. This is important. Okay? So here is the uh, conceptual framework in a nutshell. At the heart of it is critical theory that has given that critical part of cross-cultural communicative competence uh, aspect, has given that critical aspect to the pedagogical competence and to the technological competence. So without that critical theory that has made the foundation 
and and has established the, 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 the critical perspective for these competences. And these competences, as you can see, they are in an interactive relationship. All right. So so uh, let's remember the C5, the CP and CTC. All right. So what is culture? If I ask this question, and when, whenever I ask this question in workshops and uh, I ask teachers or pre-service teachers to define culture, they give me that traditional definition of culture. That's the one that's prevailing in textbooks. I rarely get a definition that uh, 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 meets the critical perspective, which is, and let me put it down here for you. The term culture is defined in this presentation within its socio-economic and political context and as part of such context. It is viewed as a dynamic process within a given social context in which individuals are in a constant struggle for representation and the need to have an authentic voice. This is very powerful, folks. This is very important. I would like you to remember this definition because it's, it cuts across all, it cuts across all the uh, uh, the topics uh, and, and themes in our uh, education today. So whatever we are doing in the classroom, culture is fundamental, is essential. Like language, language and culture, they interact and they are always there. So let's remember that from a critical perspective, culture is a dynamic process. It's not a product, it's not a commodity, all right? It's a dynamic process within a given social context in which individuals are in a constant struggle for representation and the need to have an authentic voice. All right. Step number one, we are still continuing to discuss this uh, step number one. So once you know your students and you possess those competences and you understand the concept of culture from a critical perspective, you need to know your subject matter. So that means if you teach math, you need to know your math subject area. Uh, language, you need to be uh, also well versed in uh, linguistics and language related uh, topics. You need to develop, and that's the next step in this, uh, or the next level in this step one, is to develop what I call a rich repertoire of developmentally appropriate TESOL methods, techniques, and approaches of instruction and assessments via call. So in the next slide, I will show you a table uh, or examples of a teacher and student's behaviors by stages of development. So that table shows, let me get to it. So here we go. Now, this is a, uh, 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 a table that shows the stage of development, the description of what students can do in general. This is their sample behavior. This is the, the sample behavior of the teacher. And these are the questioning techniques that are recommended or required for this stage of development for students who are in the pre-production stage. By the way, the pre-production stage is also referred to as the silent period. Okay, so, so or, or the comprehension uh, stage period, uh, stage. So at that stage, educators need to understand that the learner, if they are in that stage of development, they will not be able to answer questions such as, what would you recommend or suggest? They will just be looking at you blank, silent. They will have no idea what you are talking about. But if you say, point to, find me the, or find the, put this thing on, all right? or you ask some either or questions, do you have a this or that? Or is this a something? So this is a developmentally appropriate type of practice. And why do we have this? We, because this has been uh, something that has been found in, in applied linguistics. So in the science of, of language, we discovered that second language learners, they go through stages in their acquisition of questions. So therefore, uh, they learn these forms of questioning in this order, okay? So we need to respect that developmental 
aspects of language acquisition and use developmentally appropriate techniques and behaviors in the classroom. All right. So for more examples on, on this, you can refer again to my book, uh, Sehlawi uh, 2018, Teaching ESL and STEM Through Call, a research-based interdisciplinary critical pedagogical approach. All right. So, so this gives you an idea of that developmentally appropriate type of uh, pedagogy that we are advocating here. All right, step number two. So step number two is to engage in what is called curriculum analysis and adaptation of input. So this will entail checking your content area standards and aligning them with your ESOL, English as a second language or English for speakers of other languages and your technology standards. You align those standards together. All right, you focus on core curriculum concepts of your grade level. You identify the required skills that you want to attain uh, 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 in order to attain those concepts. All right, and then, and then you start working on your uh, planning. So this leads you to step number three. You conduct what is called a linguistic analysis, all right? So the question that you are going to be asking is, what kind of language is required to express such concepts or function? Now, this will also lead us to the concepts, the fundamental concepts that are discussed in the, the field of TESOL and the second language acquisition, which are CALPS versus BICS. The CALPS, the CALPS stand, it stands for Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency Skills, and the BICS stands for the Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills. These skills are totally different. So the CALPS, for example, as you know, they take forever to develop. They take up to seven years, whereas the BICS can be developed in six months or a year. So the BICS is your social language. The CALPS is your academic language. And that makes a huge difference. What flunks kids at school is not the BICS, it's the CALPS, all right? So we know that. So let's take an example. So for example, as illustrated in the book, again, if you go to pages 23, 28 through 29, you will see a, an example of a curriculum analysis. So the curriculum in a given content area, for example, focuses on the concept of comparing and contrasting. To answer the above question, we can make a list of structures and vocabulary that express such function or concept as follows. Functions, comparing and contrasting. So that's what the, the curriculum is asking for. So I go through that and I uh, jot down my function, all right, my concept. Now I move on to the structures. In order to express that function, what do I need? I need material the stuff that we use, all right, that we call structures. So in this case, I need some comparatives, I need some superlatives, comparatives such as bigger than, all right, so you can have adjective plus er than or less. Or you can use an adjective plus uh, uh, stuff like uh, uh, more expensive than, all right, or as expensive as. Etc. So those are comparatives. But superlatives are things like this is the most uh, expensive, this is the biggest. Those are superlatives. Okay. So now I fix my structures. Those are the, that's the structure, and it's simple present tense. By the way, you can say this car is more expensive than this car. All right. Simple present tense. Simple sentence structure. I move on to vocabulary, and that's when I have to list the different adjectives and modifiers that I'm going to be using. Now, as far as grammar, I already touched uh, upon that. It's simple sentence structure, that's syntax, simple sentence structure. All right, so I'm done with my linguistic analysis. I, I know my curriculum analysis, that's the concepts, that's what the TICs, for example, in the states of Texas, they call them TICs. You go to another state and they are called stand content standards. 
you get those from your core, common core standards, whatever it's, it's, uh, it's called in the world, you get your curriculum concepts that you are required to teach at that grade level. And then you go, you, you go through this linguistic analysis and you are now focusing on the CALPS. All right, so step number four. Step number four is crucial, is important. And that's when you have to, to, to write and, and create clear ESOL instructional objectives. Okay, so, so again, if you want to see some examples of these, and there are three domains that, that we address in the area of TESOL, content objective, language objectives, and the social slash language learning strategies. So see page 76, for example, on chapter, in chapter two in the book, for examples of how to, uh, or how these ESOL objectives can be adapted to various stages of development and, and, and uh, practice some of that. So remember that adaptation is not about asking for less from the student. That's very important. Most of the time, teachers would write an objective and then the adapted version of the objective is basically asking for less. That is not what, what adaptation is about. So uh, chapter two contains a sample lesson plan and more opportunities for practice. So check it out. Step number five. Well, step number five, basically now I have my uh, curriculum analysis, linguistic analysis, I have my, my objectives and I have aligned my standards, I have done all of that. Now it's the time to make sure your classroom curriculum reflects the, di the diversity of your students and their needs. That you are using project-based learning methodology and you are engaging students in active learning. They are not going to be passive. You are not going to do some paper and pencil type of activities and bore them to death. You make it more engaging project-based learning is crucial, is very powerful. You connect your classroom with your community and the globe, all right? Your assessment is always triangulated. It's always authentic, okay? So, so again, I would refer you to the uh, research-based criteria that are discussed in CLRA 2018 for how call apps and programs should be selected and used to empower this critical pedagogical approach. All right, so uh, of course this approach will include selecting a or securing a non-threatening positive school environment. That is important. All pedagogues, all linguists, all educators uh, around the world would, would, would tell you that without having uh, such non-threatening positive environment, no learning will take place, period. That's a prerequisite for, for not learning. Using material from students' background, different genres of text is essential, including contributors to this humanity or this human civilization from their culture. For example, if you teach algebra and you uh, fail to mention Jabir ibn Hayyan and al Khawarizmi when you are teaching, for example, algorithm or so on and so on and so forth. There are so many contributors from all cultures. They need to be represented. Again, representation. Remember that uh, the definition of culture as a dynamic process, as a struggle over meaning and representation. That's important. Kids will feel so secure and, and will have, uh, uh, will develop a positive self-esteem uh, when they know that they are represented, with their culture is represented, is reflected, their language is appreciated, and so on and so forth. And they feel safe and secure. All right, so we're still talking about step number five. Um, of course, part of that planning and design phase is for you to select appropriate call apps, all right, or cool call apps <laughs> that meet the research-based criteria discussed in, in the book. And, and, and you should use a sheltered instruction approach or approaches or methods, techniques and procedures to attain your instructional objectives, okay? So the bottom line is we need to know not just what to teach, but why we teach what we teach the way we are teaching it in order to establish 
social justice through education for a sustainable future. Okay? Now, sustainability and sustainable future in education is, is an area of study, is, is a field of study. And the next slide, I'm going to share with you uh, some thoughts from Dr. Cloud on education for a sustainable future. So let's take a listen. I was in the first experiment in global education as an 11 year old. This was 1968. And they were going to prepare us to live in a world of complexity and change and diversity and uncertainty. And I grew up to become a global educator because I thought that was the edgiest, most 21st century thing to do. The word sustainability arrived on the radar screen in 1987 in a UN report called Our Common Future. And I read that report and I thought, I think I'm tracking unsustainability. What is sustainability? That seems like a much better idea. And how do I educate for it? And then in 92, there was a big summit. That was the official birth of education for sustainability. And 174 countries agreed to move towards sustainability. And then I thought I was late in 1995 to found the center. But by that time, I needed to devote the rest of my life to figuring out how do you educate for the kind of future we want. So we started with questions and a learning community and went on to build courses and units. And now we work with whole schools, whole districts, and whole districts in their communities, and sometimes whole states. I am not a big believer in spending a lot of time coping with decline. We want to head toward reversing climate change. One of the ways we educate for sustainability using climate change as an entry point is to explain to kids how the planet actually works. We don't focus on climate change. We focus on a healthy and sustainable future. By doing so, not only will we reverse climate change, but we'll increase biodiversity, justice, equity, economic prosperity, all of the elements of sustainability. All right, now, now that we have heard one of the leading um, researchers in the field of education uh, for a sustainable future, and in order to attain these goals of sustainability in education, we need to speak what I call two languages, the language of critique and the language of possibility. And I have illustrated and given examples in the book on how educators uh, um, were able to use the language of critique and language of possibility while educating English language learners and using call as a powerful tool. Okay, so uh, what are these languages and how, how are they related? Um, and before I move on to, um, so you know what you are doing. Okay, when I ask you why are you using this app versus this app, or why are you using this technique or method versus that technique or method, you should be able to tell me why. All right, and defend yourself pedagogically. Now, the next step is called the language of possibility, and that is the ability to bring about change through that language of critique. Okay, so if you uh, check pages 19 through 20, uh, you will see some uh, great um, classroom scenarios and vignettes of educators uh, who have been able to use the language of critique and the language of possibility. So this one we have already talked about the, uh, um, uh, the concept of uh, literacy uh, from a critical perspective. So that's it for the time being and I wish that uh, you found this uh, presentation helpful and informative. If you have questions you can always contact me, email me or check my website for more information on this concepts and other concepts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.